Greetings and salutations, my friends. Uh, this video is about the lore of the Anvil of Apotheosis and some of the related connected terms. Uh, this is also a video about the etymology of the term apotheosis and a discussion of the historical inspiration that reinforces and supports the lore in Age of Sigmar. So this is a rather amazing image of Azerheim, uh, the internal city in Azir, in the realm of heavens, and the domain of Sigmar. I love how the heavens here represents both the sky, thunder, lightning associated with Sigmar, and space, um, as it rightly should be. <laughs> That's, you know, classically how the term is being used. Uh, in the upper right hand corner, you can see an image of a fire, fiery planet. Uh, that's Malice, uh, the fiery core of the world that was, the setting of Warhammer fantasy. And Malice, strictly speaking, means kind of a piece of wool in Latin. Um, I don't quite know what that is an attempt to derive in terms of connotations about crafting or something along those lines, but Malleus uh, means hammer in Latin, and that term is you know, naturally a recurring motif within Warhammer lore. Uh, you can see my video about the Malleus Maleficorum. Um, around Malice, you can see this orbital ring. Now that's called the Sigmar Abulum, or the World Ring. And it's there that the Stormcast Eternals and their arms are forged using the resources of Malice, this kind of mystical, arcane uh, material from the core of the world that was. So this term, Sigmar Abulum, is a great Latinized term. Uh, it con conjures Sigmar, obviously, but the Bulum suffix here uh, is used um, when denoting an instrument, place, or person. And in this case, it really could be all three. So it's a, a really perfect fitting term uh, within the lore. There are several different characteristics or components of the Sigmar Abulum. One is the Tower of Apogee, and at its top is the Chamber of the Broken World. The tower is situated on kind of the inner curve of the ring facing Malice. And it's thought to be kind of the first component of the Sigmar Abulum around which the ring was created. So that's kind of the core, the first starting piece of the ring that they used to build out upon. Now, I doubt this is you know, maybe too intuitive to people, but the term apogee is an interesting choice here. Um, the modern term is French, but it's derived from Latin and Greek. Um, and you have apo, which means away, and g, uh, which signifies the earth. You can think of Gaia, the kind of the Greek goddess of the earth in that context. Um, and so you have this term that basically means away from the earth, right? So um, that's what the term means when you combine both both the components. And it generally means um, a measurement of the farthest or farthest point, highest or farthest point from the Earth. Uh, in the context of astronomy, apogee is kind of the furthest point in the orbit of an object from the Earth. So within um, Warhammer Fantasy, prior to Age of Sigmar, you might know that geographically there's kind of a one-to-one -one comparison of the world to our own, right? You can make the same comparison in races and cultures, but it's a little more politically incorrect. All this to say that the term here used to describe the tallest tower on an orbital ray surrounding Malice, i.e. Earth, is wonderfully accurate in its meaning. Although it, it denotes kind of the inner piece as opposed to kind of the outer part of the realm, so, or, or the ring. So I don't know how accurate it truly is, but it's an interesting term to be used. So around the Tower of Apogee, there are these many smaller towers and connecting walkways. Each of these smaller towers has a pylon uh, on top that flows of constant lightning. Uh, those are called the, the soul mills, where the souls of deceased stormcast wait to be reforged. There are all manner of, of artillery and defenses to protect these towers from attacks and the occasional perils of the void, referenced within the lore as Starborn, starborn monstrosities, which is so cool, and it really conjures up all sorts of manners of crazy images in your imagination. You can just think of this ring around this planet situated in the stars being attacked by some crazy star monster of some sort. Um, <laughs> as already mentioned, at the very top of the central tower is the Chamber of the Broken World. 
and that is accessed by two giant doors covered in celestial carvings beyond the skill of mortal hands. Now, naturally, the door is guarded by only the greatest warriors, the Paladin Conclaves, that have undergone the trial's accumulation, and even then they're only allowed to guard sentry for 12 days and nights. The doors are also guarded by two clockwork gargants, like giants in Age of Sigmar language, um, constructed of gold and brass and fashioned in the likeness of Mog and Gamog. These are two giants that once served as Sigmar's shield bearers in penance for their earlier defiance, and each of the automatons is, is adorned with their respective death mask. I love this idea. I, I love the idea of these uh, you know, kind of clockwork giants that are guarding the door. And death marks, uh, masks are quite popular, or, or were quite popular throughout some areas of history. In particular, kind of the 19th century, the, a lot of historical figures had these masks made upon their death. Uh, you can think of Beethoven, uh, Cromwell, Napoleon, Nietzsche, all had death masks to preserve their appearance. Uh, the Romans themselves used to keep uh, collections of these types of masks uh, depicting their ancestors and um, specific festival days would walk around wearing the mask and the individuals associated clothing as they were kind of taking on their persona. Um, perhaps the most famous death mask is probably the one proclaimed to belong to Agamemnon uh, found in the ruins of Mycenae, but sadly it's probably not actually associated to him. All right, the, the chamber of the broken world is vast and it's roofed by a dome of dark glass wrought from the sands of the Kalem Desert. Kalem, or more properly Kylum, is a Latin word for heaven, so it's quite fitting for this desert in the realm of heavens. The chamber itself is divided into the tiers of trial on gargantuan clockwork platforms perpetually moving around the central core. So once a soul passes through the Tower of Apogee, they enter the chamber and must pass through each tier to be reforged into a Stormcast Eternals. Uh, eternal. And the three tiers here are the Forge Eternal, the Cairns of Tempering, and the Anvil of Apotheosis. The reforging is this excruciatingly painful process, and these souls that cannot survive simply dissipate into the firmament of the heavens. They basically just dissolve away. And the Forge, the Forge Eternal is where you would find the six smiths, kind of these Duarden demigods who maintain the fire of creation, which burn souls until their impurities and weaknesses are being removed. Um, the cairns of tempering are seven great stones taken from the surface of malice by Grungi, and the passing souls must pass seven tests that uh, he himself has devised. If you think of kind of the twelve labors of Hercules or the tribulations of, Od of Odysseus, uh, it's common for these uh, types of heroic characters to undergo trials such as these and kind of experience pain and loss. Uh, that's really integral to the heroic character. Um, hardships in some way just creates the hero. Um, and it's especially true in dealing with demigods. Um, when I think about these types of concepts, I think of Nietzsche's concept of amor fati, uh, love of one's fate, um, kind of despite all the trials, tribulations, and loss along the way. And honestly, I think there's a really interesting theme to think about in the modern era, that uh, hardship and pain is, is actually kind of this good thing along the way. So after the Eternal Forge and the Cairns of Tempering, we come to the Anvil Apotheosis, and it's this amazing artwork depicting this location. So this kind of ensorcel art altar is made of pure Sigmarite, torn from the core of Malice by Sigmar himself, naturally. Uh, it smolders with the heat of that world's dying and sits atop a dais fashioned in the heart in the shape of a high star. And this is where the six smiths reshape the souls using the fury of lightning to recreate the bodies and weapons of the Stormcast Eternals. Right, that's the essence of the lore at the moment. It's um, epic, elaborate, majestic, and it's here that the souls of heroes undergo the painful process to become a Stormcast. They undergo apotheosis. Uh, that's what this video is called, and I want to dwell on the meaning and significance of this term a little longer. Um, apotheosis is the process by which a mortal becomes a god. 
right? In this case, Sigmar has chosen mortal heroes, taken them, purified them, and physically forged them into demigods, instilled with a portion of his own strength. And I love this concept, actually. Um, I'm all for, you know, regular strong, strong man humans, but there's something about the kind of that demigod uh, feel that I particularly like and, and, and certainly enjoy. And, you know, when you think also about how their, you know, counterparts, uh, the warriors of chaos, their kind of antithesis and nemesis, um, they too are, you know, often uh, instilled and, and, and very much uh, empowered by the dark gods, right? By, you know, if it's a warrior of corn that has really given themselves to corn, not only do they just kind of maybe have that little extra bit of strength, but they can potentially get some crazy mutation or, or, or eventually ascend to become a demon prince. Like they, they become stronger through the power of their god. And, you know, I love the fact that the forces of good now have this kind of counterpoint, this, uh, counterpoint leverage that you know, didn't exist in Warhammer Fantasy, where now they have these demigods that can stand against these people on a kind of a one-to-one -one basis. So the term apotheosis here is from ancient Greek. Um, it's from the verb apotheo. Um, and uh, you can think of, when you think of terms that are terms like th theos, uh, you can think of theocracy, theology, things like that. Um, when it gets combined with the pref prefix apo and the prefix sis, those are both uh, denote movement and action. So it's this compound word that can be read through its parts as apotheosis. And it basically means to deify, to make something godlike. Um, in Latin, it comes from the process of divinization and deification in terms like Deficacio, uh, which basically means to make something divine. So naturally, there are some examples of apotheosis throughout human history, or, you know, <laughs> as, as real as it can get anyway. But for examples, I'll kind of fall back upon my classical and historical interests. Um, you, there are, for example, demigods in the Greek and Roman worlds. Uh, those are generally um, created through kind of birthright, right? They're half human, half God through the process of procreation, right? Their, their parents uh, were gods, or at least one of them. Uh, most often Zeus, he tend to kind of get around a little bit. Um, but you can think of Hercules, Achilles to some extent, Perseus, um, even Remus and Romulus in the Roman context, and many others that uh, basically um, claim to have this kind of godlike characteristic. But these figures are somewhat myth mythical. Um, even among the best of them. And I feel like you can, you know, a, a true form of apotheosis is something that in really ways is mortal, but becomes a god. Um, in the historical East, you had pharaohs and Persian kings, and it was a little more acceptable to accept someone's claims to divinity. Um, consciously, you could also include Jesus of Nazareth in this context, context as well. Um, there's Often a divide here between the people in the West that were generally skeptical of these types of claims and those in the East that were just because of the cultural context a little a little more easier to accept. Um, the Romans were traditionally against this type of concept of, of uh, someone becoming a god. And for that matter, they were kind of very much against the idea of, of kingship in general. So it's, it's somewhat ironic that over the course of a couple of generations, they accepted both in the guise of the emperor. Um, Greece is, of course, right at the intersection of East and West. Um, I actually didn't know this beforehand, but Philip II of Macedon was the first, apparently, to claim divine honors. Um, his son, Alexander the Great, obviously conquered much of the East and adopted many Eastern customs while doing so. Um, and when he conquered Egypt, he visited one of the most famous oracles in the ancient world, uh, that is the Oracle of Jupiter Amun. Amun was a traditional Egyptian deity depicted of curled horns. So it's kind of a type of cultural fusion, uh, Jupiter in the guise of Amun, if you will. Um, for example, I'm using this wonderful map by Abraham Ortelius, uh, which depicts the, the campaign or expedition of Alexander and 
so much of the content of the map is focused on this temple because it's so it's so important to the you can see the temple in the bottom left there it's such such a significant event to the history of of alexander's life because after visiting that uh, temple thereafter he mints these coins showing him with the curled horns of amen and based upon the oracle's divinations he claimed to be the son of jupiter so augustus also visited the same oracle when he had finally kind of dealt with mark antony and secured the roman world under his sole authority in the roman context it is augustus who proclaims his adopted father julius caesar as a god um, shortly after julius caesar's assassination in 44 bce a comet appeared in the heavens uh, visible over Rome. Um, Augustus pointed to it and proclaimed that it was the manifesta manifestation of Caesar's soul. Uh, here's actually a coin minted by Augustus. Uh, that's his portrait on the left. And the verso is a proclamation of Julius's divinity and an image of the comet. Now, comets are a huge deal even in Warhammer, obviously, and Sigmar himself is associated with the twin tail comet. Uh, again, not too dissimilar from that depiction. And this this association and, and the proclamation of divinity with the comet is um, probably directly linked to, to the, the lore in that regard. Uh, there were cult shrines to ancient heroes throughout the ancient world. Um, Augustus resisted the temptation and offered, and kind of the, the offer to, during his life, to be considered a god, but he did accept honors of what would eventually become the imperial cult. Uh, whether or not he kind of happily took those upon himself or just realized it was inevitable as the empire now incorporated both eastern and western uh, parts of the Mediterranean. Uh, but thereafter, emperors would be considered gods, but generally only upon their death. Uh, those that claimed divine status while alive were controversial. You can think of Caligula and Nero uh, in that regard, people that were, you know, claimed to be very much divine while they were walking around and, and um, certainly some people chafed at that idea. So it's a little difficult to see how serious they took these claims, even in the Roman world. Uh, temples were erected in the name of a, a deceased emperor, and sacrifices were indeed made to gain their favor, but you also have Vespasian joking offhand about becoming a god when he dies. Um, so it's, like everything in the ancient world, it's a mixed bag, and it's really difficult to know uh, whether or not there's any kind of hardline truth to these things. Undoubtedly, some people adamantly believe both. Um, both that he was a god and that it's absolutely a joke. <laughs> so that, that's, that's the nature of human, human civilization and history for you. So there are two different types of apotheosis, generally, when we speak of these things. Oh, also mentioned just Augustus is, and Julius Caesar for that matter, because he's uh, accepted into the, uh, into the same house as Julius Caesar, um, in the same family. Uh, but Julius Caesar always claimed uh, that his family went back to Venus, and so there's association with that family as well. And so they, they too have this somewhat divine birthright, although they never actually claimed it during their lifetime until, until Julius Caesar's death. So basically there are two different types of apotheosis, one by birthright, that is you obtain divine status upon kind of the melding of God and mortal through procreation. The other is achieved through achievement, but generally involves death. Uh, this continues that theme of hardship, pain, and struggle to achieve something great. And I think you can really think here in terms of Warhammer lore about how Sigmar really only manifested himself after the death of Kalfranz. And you can also think about how the Stormcasts are really... You know, not only is it this excruciatingly painful process to become Stormcast Eternal, but they are not themselves when they walk through that final process. When they come out the other end of this and they are Stormcast, they have lost a part of themselves. And that continues to be a price they pay every single time they're reforged. They just lose part of their memory, part of their identity. Um, and that's just, again, this beautiful kind of connotation that they melded into this lore. All these themes, I think, from the ancient world and, and other uh, cultural contexts and just have all the pieces in place to create these truly heroic uh, characters. And um, honestly, these are the types of things that I absolutely love about Warhammer. 
Um, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Please consider supporting my channel, subscribing, liking, commenting, and sharing. All those good things. I'll see you in the next one.